Yeah. Hello and welcome to our today's lecture. Um, last week, I told you that maybe we have a chance to meet in person at the university and have a hybrid lecture. But so far, this is not possible because uh, the rule is that the teacher must wear a mask while teaching. And I think this is very difficult for me, but I think it also makes me uh, also difficult uh, to understand. Therefore, until this rule uh, is, is changed, uh, we will continue with the uh, digital format, but maybe we'll take it by the end or so. And I would really be happy to meet at least those of you who are in Würzburg in person and we try somehow to, to make this uh, possible. But, but so far it's not possible. And I think teaching with a mask is really difficult for me and difficult also for you. Okay, so where do we stand? We are discussing the ECB's monetary policy. And uh, last week we talked about the targets of the ECB, the ECB's mandate and uh, possible trade-offs. Today we'll go a step further and uh, we'll uh, discuss the ECB's strategy. Um, what the purpose of the strategy is, I will explain in the following. And um, so, yeah, the interesting thing is uh, it's quite timely that we discuss the ECB strategy today because uh, the members of the ECB's Executive Council met over the weekend uh, in the Taunus uh, to discuss exactly this issue and uh, the strategy and the revision of the strategy uh, is something that uh, Madame Lagarde uh, announced very early already at her first press conference in December 2019. She said, we will have a strategic review and uh, she was announced something very comprehensive. She said, uh, the strategic review needs to be comprehensive, needs to look at all and every issue, return each and every stone. So that sounds really, <laughs> I don't, don't know whether she has a river in mind with these stones, or, I don't know. Um, and, um, and she said, um, it's the point of every strategic review by all central banks to actually look at the objective how they define their medium term objective in particular, and how they give content to the price stability that is in their mandate. We talked about uh, the definition uh, of, of price stability and, and the way the ECB interprets so far price stability. Um, and then uh, the president get, went on and she, she said uh, the strategic review will also address the massive technological change, the immense challenge that climate change um, will, will, will pose. It will include aspects of inequality that are certainly arising in our economy. So it's very ambitious what Madame Lagarde has in mind. And of course, we are now waiting for the result of the strategic review. Uh, the ECB had planned to present this review uh, already last year, but due to the pandemic, of course, the, the things that were more important. Uh, but I think we can expect uh, the result of this review relatively soon. And well, the question will then be um, whether the uh, review will lead to uh, similar results as the uh, points that I will present you today uh, concerning monetary policy strategies. So the ECB already started its operations with a strategy. Um, this is different because there are central banks that do not have a strategy. So the Fed never had an explicit strategy. And the ECB already in 1998, before it started its operation, developed, designed a strategy. Um, and um, this strategy, uh, which is more or less still, uh, still in operation, uh, has two elements. One element is a quantitative definition of price stability, something we discussed already last week, and then a two-pillar approach to the analysis of the risks to price stability. And this two-pillar approach consists of two elements, of an economic analysis and of a monetary analysis. And um, we'll discuss this in, in, more, in more detail. But at first sight, if you ask a central bank what is your strategy? And the central bank tells you, well, we have a monetary analysis. So we look at all kinds of monetary indicators. 
And we have economic analysis where we look at all kinds of economic indicators. You would say, yes, that's what we expect you to do. This is at least something that the central bank should do, that they analyze monetary developments, economic developments. So and we'll discuss this in more detail. But this information content of the central bank that says, we look at monetary and economic developments is very low obviously, because that's what you expect. And so we will discuss this in, in more detail, but this is the old strategy. Um, and this is now where uh, uh, the ECB uh, will start its review. And it will be interesting uh, whether this two pillar strategy will survive the strategic review or not. So I, I fear that central banks are conservative and that some form of two pillar strategy will also be there after. Uh, the review, but let's see. So, question: What is a monetary policy strategy? Policy strategy? What what is the rationale? Why do you need a monetary policy strategy? And I just told you, uh, not all central banks have a strategy. But I think the main idea of a strategy is that it helps the public to understand why central bank is doing certain things, because we all know that uh, the economic system, economic reality is extremely complex and there are thousands of factors that play a role for monetary policy decision-making. And of course you can operate with a huge macroeconomic model with 150 equations uh, and central banks have these, these macroeconomic models. But uh, if you go to the press as Madame Lagarde and uh, tell the audience at the press conference today, we've increased our uh, our uh, uh, key policy rate by 0.5 percentage points because that's what our computer calculated. <laughs> then if people ask you, oh, why, yeah, because I, I don't know. So, you know, you can look at the, the program, it's 150 equations and a very complex program and the result is 0 0.5 uh, points uh, increase. So, the audience would not be really satisfied yeah, because they could probably say, yeah, please, please look at the, the manuals and the codes. Then you can see how the, how the computer program uh, works. And uh, if maybe you can another program, you can also try. But this is not something that would convince people. So the idea of the strategy is to develop a kind of framework, a simple framework where people say, aha, they are doing it because, and then can somehow, as it is uh, phrased today, you can, can provide some narrative where you can present the complex uh, uh, decision-making process in a very simple way that people can understand easily. And I think that's, that's the idea of the strategy to write some kind of narrative, some kind of simple framework, which allows the public to understand why is it now necessary to increase interest. Even if you have the computer program running, uh, it's still important uh, for the uh, for the central bank uh, to, to have to have such a strategy, and therefore I think it's very important that the ECB is now trying to revise the strategy. So, and um, one can describe a strategy as a narrative. One can also describe it as a rule of thumb, and the rule of thumb is something which plays an important role in the behavioral economics. And uh, the more scientific word for rule of thumb is heuristic, and, but it means the same. And it means that you can reduce a very complex reality to some very simple cues to make complex decision processes very, make complex decision processes very simple. I think that's, that's the idea. And, and why do you need behavioral economics and why do you need heuristics? You only need it uh, once you realize uh, that we do not have this homo economicus who knows everything. The homo economicus doesn't need heuristics because he has all relevant information. And in his head, he has a computer that can deal with complex uh, questions and has, can also deal with 150 equations. And then he always makes the right decision. But of course, this assumption of homo economicus is not something uh, that is, uh, applies, applies to reality. And this it was uh, the reason for the field of behavioral economics to emerge and behavioral economics 
is, is a kind of combination of psychology and economics, and it's, it's something that has developed in the last 20, 25 years, and which is a, is a prominent, important part of, of economics. Probably not all introductory courses, but, but definitely it is important precisely because we do not have this homo economicus, and there are many situations uh, where we have extremely complex decisions to take, and there heuristics are the way how we all take our decisions. And Richard Taylor, who got the Nobel Prize in 2017, um, uh, made this nice statement. He said, think of the human brain as a personal computer with a very slow processor and a memory system that is both small and unpredictable. I don't know about you, but the PC I carry between my ears has more disk failures than I care to think about. And he said this thing in the 90s, uh, not knowing that he would once be awarded uh, with a Nobel Prize, but I think, yes, if we ask ourselves, we think very, I think a very good description of, of how uh, our, our minds function. And um, so, what is, what is the idea of heuristics? And so we have Gerd Gierenzer, who is a German uh, specialist on uh, behavioral economics, teaching in Berlin. And, and I think he emphasizes most of all that uh, heuristics are something very useful, helpful, uh, because we are permanently confronted with complex decision-making processes and uh, most of the time we very we, we have to, to make these, these, these decisions without being home in this economy see. Um, and um, so we need heuristics. So simple heuristic when you are somewhere in a, in a foreign city and you want to go to a restaurant and you have two restaurants, and one restaurant where nobody is sitting and the other restaurant there's a line in front. So the heuristic is obviously the one where everybody goes is, is a better one. And uh, so you don't need a lot of, of information research. Of course, today with TripAdvisor, it's easier to find restaurants than, than 10, 50 years ago. But this is how we, how we make decisions. And um, so in Kigerenz, he shows uh, many examples where uh, by using heuristics, we make in most cases good decisions. Also, we don't need too much information. Of course, it's uh, the behavior is guided by heuristics is somehow conservative because one heuristic is that you just take the information that you have to take the available information and to try to make the best out of the available information to see that people are standing in line for a restaurant. Um, and so if, if, you, if you use available information that also has a kind of conservative bias in decision making. Um, there's another, there are other um, researchers uh, who um, to deal with the problems that arise when we make decisions based on heuristics, uh, so-called biases. And uh, so there's Daniel Kahneman and Amos, Tres Amos Tversky who have advanced this kind of research. research. Kahneman was also awarded with the Nobel Prize and a nice example for uh, systematic errors due to biases is the anchor heuristic and the anchor heuristic is a nice example when you are in vacation and then you want uh, some, some market and well, they sell some, I don't know, some, some, some gifts, some, some uh, uh, vases or whatever. And, and you go to, this, to the guy who sells something and, he's, he's, and you ask him, how much does it cost? And he says, it costs 50 euros. Uh, and then you start to bargain with him and make then after you have reduced by 50%, let's say 25 euros, you're happy. Yeah? But maybe the whole thing has only a value of three or four euros. The problem is by asking him and by his answer, 50 euros, he sets an anger in your mind, you say, oh, 50 euros. And then from this, you start to make your, your, your bargaining process, but maybe you could just go down directly to 10 euros and say, I give you 10 euros. Uh, and see how, how he reacts. But normally, I think we are tempted to start with the 50 euros and put it down from this. Uh, and that's a nice thing when you're on vacation, so check <laughs> you go to local markets. So be careful uh, when you buy some, some nice uh, souvenirs uh, that you not become uh, 
a victim of, of the anchor heuristic. And anchor heuristic means that you take the information that is available. And from this information, you start um, your, your, your decision process. And there's a nice example um, for, for anchor heuristic is, so if you, if you have a class in front of you with the, with the real lecture, not, not the, the, the Zoom, um, so you divide your class into groups and you ask the first group, will the Han Sen index, the Hong Kong stock index, be above or below 17,000 points at the end of the year? You ask first this question, and you have the other group, you ask them, will the Hang Seng index be above or below 24,000 points at the end of the year? So you ask both uh, groups, you've divided the class into groups, and they just have to say below or above. And then as a second step, you ask the, the students in each group, make a point forecast for the index. And um, so st what studies shows is that the group uh, which gets the anchor of 70,000 makes lower point forecast than the group uh, that gets uh, the 24,000 as, as an anchor. So by giving a number in the minds of, of, the, of the students, they start to make, they start the decision pro process with this anchor. And that's quite interesting uh, ob observation. And, and of course, the more you know about uh, the Hang Seng index, the less it will work. So if you are a specialist in Hong Kong stock exchange uh, and you have your own view, uh, then the anchor will probably not be so effective, but the less you know about it, the more the anchor will affect your decision processes. So, and so my interpretation of a heuristic, of, of a monetary policy strategy is to, to, to regard it a little bit as heuristic, as something that helps to reduce the complexity of monetary policy decisions, something which is relatively simple, which is a framework that is somehow easy uh, to understand. And, and so I will show you in the following half for different strategies how this de facto also can, can be achieved. And um, why, why do the central banks need a monetary policy strategy? I think there are two dimensions. One mentioned is internal decision making process um, if you see on the on the on the picture you see the members uh, of the ecb's governing council and they have 26 members you imagine them all sitting around a table and whenever they meet a uh, decision must be made will we change interest rates or not will we continue uh, asset purchase sales or not will we reduce the speed of this and and of course um, very not all of them uh, have, have studied economics um, and and so you need I think in for the internal decision making process some framework that what normally the, the decisions are prepared by the executive council of the ECB um, so the six members sitting sitting in Frankfurt but the executive council needs the, the consent uh, of the others and I think here this strategy is also helpful for, for, this, for this body of 26 people uh, who have to make these decisions on an on ongoing basis. And of course, the, the, the external dimension of the strategy is, is communication uh, with the public to explain why does the central bank take, why does the central bank take certain decisions? And here, I think it's important in, because if the public can understand what the ECB is doing, so, the decision-making processes become transparent, and the transparency also helps to the credibility of the central bank. And credibility means that the public expects that the ECB still adheres to its target, to its mandate, because that's something that is always can always be discussed: is the ECB really committed to achieve its target, or are they are they preparing inflation? And um, therefore, for a central bank, it's very important to be so as transparent that the public can realize, yes, whatever they do, all they do is really focus on achieving uh, the target of price stability. And, um, and, uh, and that's what we mean with credibility. And I think we discussed it last week. Um, credibility means that 
inflation expectations uh, of the private sector are identical with the ECB's inflation target. And once you have this situation, it's relatively easy for the central bank to achieve its target. It's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. And therefore, the strategy is so important to be transparent, to become credible. And then you have this, uh, this, this happy, uh, lucky situation where the public exactly expects your inflation target. And then we are already we are, we are on track with your monetary policy. So um, I would say the ECB in the past has not always been so successful in its communication with the public, especially in Germany. Um, there have been many critics saying the ECB is expropri expropriating the German saver with its low interest rates. Um, also, the German Constitutional Court has heavily criticized the ECB one year ago. Uh, for not explaining sufficiently what, what it does, why the ECB does certain things. So there's definitely something, uh, some improvement required. And I think that is exactly what the strategic review uh, intends to do. So what monetary policy strategies do we know? And it's the uh, guiding principle of this course to say, okay, uh, we have these different economic paradigms, the different economic paradigms shape uh, also economic policy. And here on the, in the area of monetary policy strategies, we can also show how these uh, paradigms shape strategies. And um, so the classical paradigm uh, is uh, influential or is, 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 a, is a basis for the strategy of monetary targeting. I think we addressed this already a little bit that we say, okay, in the classical paradigm, there's in principle no role for the central bank, but if you want to give it a role, then uh, it can be only the role of determining a price level in the economy. Also the price level is not really important for the classical model, but nevertheless, if you want to attribute a role to the uh, central bank, then it's just, controlling the price level by controlling the money stock. And we have already addressed Milton Friedman, who uh, said that if central bank wants to fine tune the economy, it creates more harm than, than uh, benefits. So that's the mon monetary policies, the strategy of monetary targeting. Then you have the Keynesian paradigm. And this is the framework for the strategy of inflation targeting. Yeah, especially the Phillips curve and inflation expectations play a role. And then in interestingly, we have also a kind of hybrid strategy that combines classical elements and Keynesian elements. That is a so-called Taylor rule, which has been very popular, uh, especially in the two 2000s. Uh, and the idea is here that the central bank interest rate is anchored by a neutral real rate. So a real rate that is derived from the classical model. Uh, but then the central bank should deviate from this neutral rate up, uh, upwards or downwards, depending on the economic situation. And of course, this is kind of Keynesian. Limit. Okay, these are the three um, monetary policy strategies that we want to discuss, and they're all embedded in an economic uh, paradigm. So let's go on with the strategy of monetary targeting. As I said, the basis for monetary targeting is the classical theory with the quantity theory of the price level and monetary monetarism. And of course, there's this famous statement by Milton Friedman, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon uh, in the sense that it is and can be produced only by a more rapid increase in the quantity of money than in output. So this is, uh, the, the, the classical approach, and um, and Friedman justifies this justifies this approach uh, with his uh, analysis of the monetary history of the United States, uh, where he said uh, with the, they came to the result that monetary actions affect economic conditions only after a lag that is both long and variable. So the idea is if you have these long and variable legs. So if you want to fine tune uh, the economy as a central bank, uh, then of course there's a risk. If you start too late with your fine tuning, 
and the effects of the fine tuning materialize only once the recession is over and then you destabilize the economy. Interestingly, uh, the studies that Milton Friedman together with Anna Schwarz made analyzed the effect of monetary actions by looking at changes in the money stock. Did not look at changes of the interest rates. So that's I think quite interesting to, because that's the saying of the long and variable legs is something which, which is yeah, very prominent. But and, and it's this analysis, empirical analysis of monetary policy, but it's based on changes in the money stock, not in changes in interest rates. And so maybe this is also one reason why you have these long and variable legs. And of course, the other assumption is this classical dichotomy, which uh, we have already mentioned several times, the idea that monetary policy has no effect on the real sphere, at least in the medium and long-term uh, perspective. So what does it imply? It implies as a strategy for monetary policy, just target the money stock, irrespective of the economic situation, irrespective of demand shocks and supply shocks, um, and do this with a focus on price stability. I think they've already quoted this by Milton Friedman. They said, just target um, monetary aggregate. It's not so important which aggregate this is. Just target it in a constant way, and that's all you need to do. And so this theoretical advice um, was uh, also uh, accepted uh, by, the, by the ECB in its first strategy, 1998. And here, uh, the, we already had these two pillars, but in the 1998 strategy, the first pillar was a monetary pillar. And uh, this monetary pillar um, was assigning a prominent role to money signaled by reference value for M3 pros. So yes, when the ECB started, 99, um, they tried to follow this monetary policy recipe by Milton Friedman, uh, target a monetary aggregate, M3. And um, yeah, so it's, it's not surprising that the ECB did this because the first chief economist of the ECB was Otmar Ising. And he, before I came to the ECB, he was the chief economist of the Bundesbank. And the Bundesbank was practicing uh, this uh, monetary targeting. We'll soon see whether it was successful or not. And so Otmar Ising, when, jo when, when joining the ECB, um, had, had so, so, so to say, the heritage of the Bundesbank, uh, the monetary targeting. And that was, so to say, his, his introductory pre uh, present for, for the ECB. And the ECB had this first pillar. So if you want to target a monetary aggregate, you have to define the target value. And the question is, how can you derive the target value for the money stock. And uh, the starting point is the quantity equation, uh, which we've already addressed also several times, which says the money stock times the velocity of money equals the price level times real. And you can transform it in growth rates, which then means the growth rate uh, of money stock equals the inflation rate plus the growth rate of real output minus the trend uh, trend of the change of the velocity of money. And um, if you transform it in this, in this way, then you can, can solve it for the growth rate of the money stock. And I think that's all you need for, for monetary targeting. You, you just transform uh, the quantity equation in, in, in first differences, and then you can, can, uh, can derive uh, the, the formula for the growth rate of money. And the question, and, and we have these then three elements. We have, uh, the, the, so how can we now give a, a concrete content to uh, the, this, uh, to, uh, to, to inflation, to real output and velocity of money? Um, so for inflation, you take the inflation target of the central bank for uh, change in output, you do, you could take the forecast of GDP, but the idea is to give the whole concept a medium term orientation. So you take the trend GDP growth or the growth of the production potential. And for velocity, you take the trend of the change in the velocity of money. 
So that's a simple formula. And uh, you can then, uh, let's see then what ECD um, made of, of, this, of this formula. So when the ECD developed, uh, started with its, with its uh, monetary targeting um, for, for the inflation target or objective, the ECD was taking a relatively conservative value of 1.5 for the growth rate of potential output, uh, the ECB decided for a range of two and two, up to two and a half percent. Uh, the velocity of M3 uh, is, is on a trend decline since many, many years. And so the ECB took a value of uh, minus uh, half a percent up to minus one percent. And adding the whole thing up, we got a reference value of 4.5%. And that was the first uh, reference value that the ECB derived and never derived a second one, they only did it once. Um, and so that's a very simple way how uh, the ECB um, uh, implied, uh, sorry, how the ECB implemented uh, monetary targeting. So, was it, was it successful? First, let's first have a short look at what the Bundesbank did. The Bundesbank um, used the same formula. So it was exactly the same elements of the formula. First, they uh, took the values from Germany. And the Bundesbank uh, did not uh, derive a reference value, but a target corridor with relatively broad bands. Let's here see from 4%. To six percent, from four percent to seven percent, um, and uh, here from uh, five. Yeah, and then after after nineteen ninety eight, um, they they uh, had a they had a two year target uh, with with the with the target quality of three point half percent to six point half percent. So the Bundesbank implemented monetary targeting. Um, on a yearly basis, so each December, the Bundesbank's uh, governing council met and they asked what will be uh, the, 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 the target growth rate for M3. And then around this uh, uh, target value, they, um, they set a corridor of two percentage points, three percentage points. And the interesting thing is that the Bundesbank did not use this target as a kind of medium term thing. And, because if you think in terms of monetarism, it's always this medium term orientation. Friedman said, you have to choose a target and then follow this target rate, whatever happens. And the Bundesbank obviously did not understand the second uh, element of the Friedman's recipe, that it should be something, so it should be a medium term um, target. The Bundesbank each year had a new corridor. And interestingly, they did not. Um, they, they did not um, use it in a medium term uh, orientation, but they use it on an annual basis. So look here at the experience of 1995, the Bundesbank had announced uh, in fourth quarter of 1994, a target corridor, four to 6%. And at the end of the year, you could see actual monetary growth was way below the corridor. And the medium term orientation would have implied, of course, that you, that you follow the growth rate that you had in mind when you decided the target for 1995. What, what did the Bundesbank say? say do, they said, okay, now we are here. Okay, let's have a new corridor. <laughs> they simply disregarded uh, the, this, 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 um, this deviation from the target, just started the new corridor wherever extra monetary growth was. And so this was definitely uh, something which, which is not in line with the medium term orientation uh, of, the, um, of the monetarists like the Friedman. And uh, if you look at the performance of the Bundesbank with its monetary targeting, and the Bundesbank started early, Bundesbank was one of the few central banks that adopted monetary targeting. The 1970s. So the whole idea of monetarism was propagated in the 90s, early 1970s, when inflation was high, when the exchange rate system of Bretton Woods had broke down, and 
until then, many central banks just packed their uh, currency to the dollar at a fixed exchange rate. That was their strategy, strategy so to say. But when this Fred and Woods system broke down, um, central banks had to, had to find something new. Inflation was high. Uh, and then the monetarists came and say, well, we have a simple way to do monetary policy, just target the money stock along this simple uh, formula that, that you've just seen. But it was only the Bundesbank that wholeheartedly adopted this strategy and pursued it until 1998. So the last year for which the Bundesbank had the um, autonomy uh, over monetary policy in Germany. But the performance uh, was not really uh, convincing. So the Bundesbank set 24 target corridors from 1975 to 1998 with these wide fluctuation ranges. But uh, in 11 years out of 25, the five the target was missed, which might be not, not a very, very uh, convincing performance. And the Bundesbank, as I said, did not correct for uh, for a year for for. Yes, when the targets were missed, they just started the new corridor whenever, wherever uh, the money, money stock was at the end of the year. Astonishingly, it's a kind of mystery. Also, the Bundesbank was, my view, not very successful in meeting these targets. The Germans loved it. So it was very popular. The Bundesbank uh, thought that, that this was really a very, very successful strategy. And of course, it explains why uh, but my ECB, coming from the Bundesbank, thought this is not exactly what the ECB needs. And that's why the ECB adopted also the reference value uh, for, for, its, for its strategy. And um, yeah, so the ECB started, as, as I said, with a reference value of 4.5% uh, in 1999. And if you look at the chart, you can see it was not really successful. So the red line here is our, this is our target. And the blue line is the reference value. And you can see that the reference value did not really like, sorry, that M3 did not like the reference value. So whenever it reached a little bit the reference value, then it rapidly moved away. And, um, and this constant deviation of M3 from the re reference value without any indication that this had an impact on inflation was the reason why the ECB silently gave up uh, monetary targeting. So it was uh, in 2003, there was the first adjustment of the, of the strategy. And then uh, the monetary pil pillar was removed from the first pillar to the second pillar. Uh, and then the reference value no longer played a role in the ECB's reports and analytical uh, charts, so it just vanished. And as, if you look at the chart, you can see it. there were these huge deviations of uh, M3 from the reference value, and there was no inflation at all. And so obviously, that was not a not a very good idea. By the way, you can see here that we have right now also a very strong increase of the money stock M3, which has to do uh, with the pandemic and uh, and the huge transfers uh, that the governments made uh, to, uh, to the private sector. Um, but interestingly, the peak here is not higher than the peak in 2007. So uh, is, this is not yet uh, a threatening development. Figures are different. If you look at the data for the United States, where the growth rate of M2 is about 20%. So it's a little bit another story. Anyhow, so you can see the reference value wasn't the idea to, to transform, to, 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 uh, yeah, to, to transport the Bundesbank's monetary target to the ECB, but it was obvious that this could not work. And I wrote a paper for the European Parliament in 1999 on the ECB strategy, and there I wrote. Uh, this the idea of a reference value uh, will not will not work, and that was not so difficult to make this forecast because you could see it did not work with the Bundesbank. Why should it should it be held in the case of the ECB? Uh, we have a question on that. Yes, um, I thought the Bundesbank or monetary policy is responsible for M3 growth. So why didn't they just make their targets happen? Because. Well, so, so it's 
the, East, the Bundesbank never said that they wanted to reach the target at any price. And, um, and, 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 and there's no responsibility in that sense. So it was, was a kind of, of um, self, um, self tying, so to say, uh, the, the Bundesbank said, we try to achieve these kinds of growth rates for the money stock. Now the problem is it's not so easy to, to control the money stock with the interest rate because um, the money stock is very much depends on, on credit growth of the bank system. So we talked about that. There's a strong uh, correlation, but all, also it's more or less it's, it's in many cases identical. So if, if credit grows, the money stock grows. And so if you want to control uh, the monetary growth in a, in a strict way, you should, must be able to control bank lending in a very strict way. And of course, this is not so easy. Now, of course, you can do it, try to do with interest rates. We've shown this, but um, it's not something that you can control in perfect way. Uh, so, um, and, and of course, uh, there's also the, the problem that, um, that you can have shifts um, between, um, between bonds and, and three components. And so it's, 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 it's very difficult to control it. So the strategy is easy. The, 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 the heuristic is easy if, if monetary growth is above the target. So there are risks for inflation and then the central bank should do something to control M3. But as I said, it's not so easy to reduce M3 growth. And of course, if, uh, if this monetary growth is below the target, there's an inflation risk and the more expansionary interest rate uh, more expansion rate, interest rate policy and, and monetary policy is, is required. And you can see that the ECB's uh, interest rates policy is not, there's no relation between uh, the ECB's interest rate policy and, and M3 growth. And therefore, I would say for the ECB, definitely uh, this reference value did not play an important role. So, um, as an assessment, as I said here, uh, there is no systematic relation between, between the growth rate of M3 and the euro area inflation rate. Monetary growth has not played a major role in the ECB's interest rate policy. And ECB interest rate policy cannot be explained by comparing M3 growth and the reference value. And um, while, the, um, while the importance of money in the ECB strategy uh, 1998 uh, was very high, at least how it how in, 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 in the in, in, in the in the strategy. But in practice, I would say the reference value of M3 has never played an important role. So let's finish uh, this first uh, part of the lecture with the question: What is wrong with monetary targeting? What's the problem? I think the main problem is that. The basis for my target is a quantity theory of money. And in the quantity theory of money, the only role of money is to serve as a means of payment. So the idea is if people have more money, they will use this money to spend it. And this has an impact on inflation. But in reality, money is also held as a store of value, especially if you have these broader monetary concepts like in three, which includes time deposits, saving deposits. Um, people do not only hold it as, 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 a, as a means of payment, but also as a store of value. So if the money stock in three increases, it can be simply due to the fact that people have more wealth, that people are willing to hold a larger part of their wealth in these uh, relatively liquid forms. And it's not an indication that this will be used, this money will be used for spending and that it will have an impact on inflation in a relatively uh, short-term uh, uh, horizon. So, yes, as I said, so um, we, we, yeah, said this more or less, and uh, and so um, increase. What was also important is, of course, this portfolio reallocations. So, as as, as uh, M three has has many components that serve as a store of value. Then, of course, you can have shifts out of um, bonds into money stock and paid in force, um, which, which also do not indicate that you will have any kind of uh, 
uh, inflationary impact. And, and finally, um, the main problem of the way how the Bundesbank used it uh, is that the quantitative theory describes very long-term uh, relationships. And, and that's the main idea of monetarism. The Bundesbank has used it uh, for a short-term analysis on an annual basis. And that's admittedly not what uh, the quantity theory has in mind. OK, I think we'll have a break. Not maybe we have just this one, and then we are out. So the question is, what can we do with the monetary pillar? And what might the ECB do with the monetary pillar? And something that we can observe is that we had this period of very strong monetary growth in, in the euro area in the years that were preceding the financial market crisis. And the problem for the ECB at that time was that they thought the increase in the money stock must have some impact on inflation due to the monetarist approach. But they did not see that, of course, the increase of the money stock is very often the same as an increase in bank loans. And if you have an increase in bank loans, that's what happened in the years 2005, 2005 2006, 2007, you have an increase in bank loans, there's a risk not mainly to price stability, but to financial stability. And so I think uh, if you have a monetary pillar uh, as a central bank, then much more for the assessment of risk to price stability, so sorry, then much more as, a, as an indicator for risks of financial instability then as an indicator of price stability. I think that could be a role for the monetary pillar. Okay, but now we make a break and five minutes, let's come back and let's talk about the strategy of inflation targeting and we need some fresh air here because now getting warm and sticky. So five to 10 minutes, we, we come back. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. So we are discussing monetary policy strategies, which is quite timely as the ECB is right now discussing uh, the review of its monetary policy strategy. And uh, in this uh, lecture, we want to discuss three different strategies, monetary targeting as a strategy, inflation targeting, and the Taylor rule. We have not just discussed monetary targeting, um, something which is a little bit of the past. Um, played an important role with the Bundesbank and by the ECB announced that monetary targeting would have an important effect for its monetary policy in practice, uh, the ECB has never paid very much attention to this reference value of money. So let's turn now to a monetary policy strategy that is very widely used. Um, and uh, which is also very simple. Maybe that's the reason why it is widely used. Uh, that's the so-called strategy of inflation targeting. And inflation targeting is something that emerged in the early 1990s, um, in the end of the 1980s. And as I said, this was a period where central banks were trying to find uh, anchors or yeah, strategies for, for their monetary policy. I think many central banks uh, realized relatively early that monetary targeting is not such a good idea. So the Bundesbank was really a little bit an outlier with its strong uh, um, the strong importance of monetary targeting, at least in its announced policy. Other central banks were always very skeptical uh, about this. I think the only exception is the US Fed, which tried monetary targeting in the early 1980s, uh, even on a weekly basis. And the result was a catastrophe because by trying to control monetary targets, just had this question, the, easy, the Federal Reserve increased its short-term rates, the federal fund rate to uh, more than 20%. And of course, this uh, caused a terrible uh, chaos uh, in the financial system because uh, we have many um, debtors at that time who had loans and these loans were on a variable interest rate basis of the long-term loans, but the interest rate was adjusted on a three-month basis based on the federal funds rate. And now you imagine if you are a debtor and you had to have a loan, and maybe you started this loan with a 6%, 7% uh, variable interest rate, and now the federal funds rate goes up to 20%, and then in a very short period of time, have to realize that now 
you have to pay 20% interest. This is a disaster, and of course, the disaster uh, was, uh, was very severe because many emerging market countries, especially in Latin America, had, uh, had loans that were on this uh, variable basis, and it, the whole uh, period of this very high interest rates in the United States uh, generated uh, a huge debt crisis in Latin America, which made many countries suffer for many, many years. So um, while, while this uh, idea of my detail was only German phenomenon and only very short term phenomenon for the United States because they gave it up, this monetary targeting in the early 80s, once they realized what a chaos this approach had created. So other central banks were trying to find something uh, and, um, and what they found uh, by the end of the 1980s, early 1990s was, was inflation targeting and the forerunners the Central Bank of New Zealand uh, and, and Canada and the Central Bank of Sweden and the Bank of England. So they very early adopted this uh, monetary targeting, uh, this inflation targeting. And um, this was a kind of pragmatic approach. So it was not based on a theory, not, at least not explicitly based on a theory. Um, it, was, it was just a pragmatic approach. How can we develop a way to communicate with the public to make clear what we are doing in a relatively easy and transparent way. I think that's uh, how, it, how it developed and it's used today in many countries, uh, uh, advanced economies, but also in developing economies. So that's really the standard strategy uh, that, is, that is followed uh, all, over, all over the world. So is there a theoretical framework basis for uh, inflation targeting, and I can say yes. Um, we have shown you our ISPC and P model, and in this model, the Phillips curve is one important element. And in the Phillips curve, um, inflation expectations play an important role for the inflation rate. And um, the idea is uh, that the business of monetary policy is relatively easy once market participants take the inflation target of the central bank as the value for the inflation expectations. And as we've seen uh, also uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, tutorials, the tutorials, in the tutorials, I think that it, once, once you have this nice situation where the expected inflation is equals inflation target, uh, the central bank can achieve the bliss point where inflation is at the target value and where the output gap is zero. And so it's very important for central banks to, to generate uh, this situation where people expect your uh, inflation target as, as, as their individual uh, inflation expectation. And it's also clear when um, inflation expectations deviate upwards or downwards, from the inflation target uh, in this period, it's not possible for the central bank to achieve an optimal uh, combination of output and, uh, and inflation. So I think that's a little bit the idea. It's the idea of the Phillips curve, the role of inflation expectations. And uh, the main idea of inflation targeting is to generate a situation where people really have trust in your uh, inflation target that people really can see that you are committed uh, to your inflation target and the better you can uh, achieve this, uh, the more people will have trust in your inflation target. Then you get this nice situation uh, where you have a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy uh, that the inflation expectations really materialize them as the actual inflation. So what are the features of inflation targeting? Well, they are not spectacular. So the idea is first that you, uh, that you define price stability as the main objective of monetary policy. Then the central bank must specify concrete values for target inflation. So which index uh, do I have in mind? Is there a fluctuation then? What exceptions uh, will, be, will be accepted? Um, I think that's pretty much what the ECB is doing already. So there is a mandate 
price stability, the ECP has made clear which index it wants to target, which target value uh, it wants to achieve, and, um, and also said it is for medium term, so with the exceptions for short term deviations. Um, so, and, and one uh, variant of inflation targeting can also be that not the central bank is announcing the target value, but that the government is, is defining the concrete target value. That's what's happening in the UK. And then um, an important element of inflation targeting are the inflation forecasts. Um, forecasts for the index uh, which, which you target, and you can, can make this inflation forecast either under the idea that money market interest rates remain constant, or uh, you make the forecast using the market's uh, um, forecast for money market rates. So inflation forecast is, is important. And then uh, what uh, uh, inflation targeting also implies is that the central bank seeks an active communication uh, with the public. Uh, and in many countries, this has been done with inflation reports, especially the Bank of England have been, have been uh, very uh, active and, and uh, very, has done a lot of uh, uh, it's done a lot of effort to, 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 to design these inflation reports to give uh, these uh, inflation forecasts a, a very comprehensive uh, uh, framework. So um, one can also say that in the way how inflation targeting is interpreted, many, most people say, well, inflation targeting cannot be combined with monetary targeting. Uh, and it can also not be combined with exchange rate targeting. So this is um, how one can describe IT. And so far, this sounds very easy. You need a target for price stability. You make forecast for price stability. Um, uh, and, and you try to communicate uh, very intensively with the public. And yeah, that's it. So. Inflation targeting is really something simple. And uh, so what is the heuristic uh, of inflation targeting? Well, um, so on an ongoing basis as a central bank, you compare your inflation forecast with your inflation target. And uh, whenever the forecast and the target are identical, it's fine, you can relax, <laughs> they're wonderful. Uh, and um, if the forecast exceeds the target, then this is a sign for alarm. It, it shows that uh, uh, you are over a time period of two or three years, you will not be able to, to meet your, your inflation target. Um, and then of course, uh, this means that as a central bank, you have to become active. You have to do something and you have to do something with your interest rates. And there are two ways to derive inflation Forecasts. One is under the idea under constant money market rates, which is not practiced right now. Uh, but the, the standard form is that central banks make inflation forecasts based on the market forecasts for the short-term interest rates. And now, when you see under the market forecasts of, of short-term interest rates, inflation forecast exceeds your target, then of course you need to increase your short-term rates in a way that uh, exceeds uh, the market forecast. So that's the very simple thing, we make the inflation forecast. If it's above the target, you have to do something with your short-term interest rates. And of course, if the, um, if the uh, inflation forecast is below the uh, inflation target, then uh, you need higher interest rates, um, or you, uh, sorry, you need lower interest rates <coughs> or if necessary, you can also start with uh, purchases of, of government bonds or corporate bonds. So very easy, uh, very easy procedure. And in fact, that's what the ECB is doing. So when you uh, follow uh, the communication of the ECB and one of the most important ways of the ECB to communicate with the public are the press conferences when the ECB council meets and takes decisions on interest rates after each of these meetings, which, are take, which, which, uh, uh, which, which take place on a six weeks uh, basis. Um, 
after each of these meetings, uh, the president goes to the press, gives a press conference, explaining why they have changed something or why they have left everything unchanged. Um, and after and, and press conference, uh, it's not only that the president gives a statement, there's also very intensive questions Q and A session where journalists have possibility to all, ask all kinds of questions. And I think the ECB uh, attaches a lot of importance to this form of communication. Um, and so when you follow these uh, press conferences, you can uh, see that inflation forecasts actually really are an essential element of the ECB's communication uh, with, the, with, the, with the public. And let me just quote from the recent uh, ECB uh, press conference uh, just, just you know, less than two weeks ago. And so Christian Lagarde said, we expect underlying price pressures to increase somewhat this year, owing to temporary supply constraints and the recovery in domestic demand. Now there comes then the longer term aspect. Nevertheless, the price pressures will likely remain subdued overall, in part reflecting low wage pressures in the context of still significant economic slack and the appreciation of the euro exchange rate. And then, now she explicitly quotes the forecast. She says, this assessment is broadly reflected in the baseline scenario of the June 2021 Euro system staff macroeconomic projection for the euro area, which foresees inflation annual at 1%, 1.9% in 2021, 1.5% in 2022, and 1.4% in 2023. Here you have the inflation forecast not only a very short-term forecast, but also kind of medium-term forecast. And here, Lagarde explicitly says, look, we have our inflation target. Inflation forecasts are below the target. This shows that we are doing the right things. So that and given the money market uh, forecasts of the market participants, so our policy is in line with the inflation target. And uh, this also on, 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 a, on a kind of medium-term basis. So that's as simple as this, that's inflation targeting. So you confront the public with this inflation forecast and you, sh and you show them, okay, also there might be some short-term shocks and short-term deviations. In the medium term, we will uh, reach our inflation targets with the policy uh, decisions, with the policy stance uh, that, we are, that we are following. And, um, and here, these are the, the data of these, uh, um, of these underlying the inflation forecast. And here you can see that the ECB, um, and the assumptions of the ECB forecast are uh, the forecasts, um, the market forecasts for inflation, uh, for, for, for the short term interest rate, 2022, 2022. 23. So the ECB is using the forecast of the micro participants for the uh, short term interest rates. And on this basis, it derives its inflation uh, forecast. The interesting thing is, while the ECB is de facto pursuing inflation target, it has, it has never formally adopted inflation targeting. So that's quite, quite interesting uh, phenomenon. Um, and um, in my view, it has to do with the fact that somehow the ECB is still having the idea that money is, plays a role and, and there is a reference value of money and that this kind of monetary strategy element is not compatible with inflation targets. So that's my explanation. So it's really astonishing that while the ECB has uh, all the elements of inflation targeting in its communication with the public, it never explicitly uh, adopted it and uh, and one way how the ECB tries to keep a little distance from inflation targeting is that it calls the inflation forecasts that uh, they make they call it inflation projection not forecast and it's also interesting that they say the inflation projection is not made by the ECB but by the ECB staff which means 
yeah, it's also a little bit strange because if uh, the ECB staff is making forecasts that uh, the ECB governing council dislikes, then maybe one should dismiss the staff. Uh, but normally it's the other way around that uh, in the council, they are unable, the members of the council are unable to make their own forecast. They simply adopt the forecast of the staff. So that's how it normally works in such institutions. Anyhow, so um, and here you can see the, uh, the forecasts uh, for the uh, HICP harmonized mix of consumer price uh, inflation rate. That's the most recent uh, forecast. And we are here, we are uh, right now in the second quarter of 2021. You can see there is a kind of spike uh, in inflation, which is due to the uh, increase of energy prices after a steep decrease uh, last year. And then the perception that what Madame Lagarde said that after this spike of inflation, that will have relatively low inflation rates, even still uh, uh, below the inflation target of the ECB. And so, what is important when Inflation forecasts play such an important role in the communication with the public. You could say, well, uh, so the, the central bank makes an inflation forecast that it thinks is nice and that fits with its uh, intentions. Um, for instance, if a central bank wants to do, want, if you assume a central bank that wants to generate inflation, you could say, well, this, this central bank simply makes low inflation forecasts, so then you can deceive the public. But there's an important control element in this inflation forecasting. Um, and this control element is that there are so many institutions making inflation forecasts. And, and the ECB is uh, presenting these forecasts also on a regular basis. And there are, uh, there are also the European Commission, there's a survey of professional forecasts of the IMF, there are many institutions. And so you can really nicely compare now uh, how is the ECB's uh, inflation forecast compared uh, to the inflation forecast of other institutions. And here you can see, well, it's more or less uh, identical. So even the ECB is even a little bit uh, less conservative than, for instance, the IMF here is 1.2, ECB is 1.5. But you can see, see it's in line. So uh, you can see that the ECB is obviously not uh, presenting a biased forecast. And I think this control element is, is, really, is really important in inflation targeting. So, how useful uh, is inflation targeting? In my view, it really helps to structure discussions about interest rate decisions because it, it's the key question is and always is the medium term inflation forecast consistent with inflation targets? That's the key question. Uh, and um, if you as a critic, the feeling this is the ECB's monetary policy is no longer adequate. In principle, what you should do is to say, okay, I have another inflation forecast. I believe, or I have calculated, or estimated that uh, in 2023, inflation rate in the euro area will be 3%. And that's, that's then a valid way to deal uh, with inflation targeting strategies. It's not, not sufficient to say, I don't like the ECB's monetary policy. I think the ECB is not doing the right things. Uh, the correct uh, way as a critic is then to say, okay, I don't believe this inflation forecast. My inflation forecast will be 3%, 4% or 5%. And then of course, exposed to then everybody can find out <laughs> who made the better forecast. Um, and I think that's, that's what the, the positive element of inflation forecasting is. And it also helps to get away uh, from the short-term inflation rate as, as a relevant uh, variable. So in Germany, you can, if you read the newspapers, they're full of all kinds of debates on inflation and why inflation is so high. And, and uh, that even this year, we might have an inflation rate of 4%. You can say yes, but what matters is not the short-term dynamics of inflation, but matters is a medium term perspective. And I think that's the important thing of inflation targeting that it brings the focus on the medium term uh, uh, of, of uh, the price, price developments. And, and it, it helps that the debates get not too much uh, focused on short term shocks that we can observe right now in Germany. Germany inflation is right, relatively high this year because 
uh, we have an increase of the value added tax. We have, we have the, for the first time, uh, carbon pricing uh, in Germany. And in addition, of course, we have also these effects of energy prices um, who were extremely low last year and are now relatively high this year. So even if you just take out uh, the energy prices out of the price index in Germany, you would come to an inflation rate at, I think, of 1.6 or 7%, which is something which is completely unproblematic. So I think that's the, the important uh, contribution of IT as a, as a strategy. It, it gives a clear framework for discussions on interest rate policies. Of course, the question is, um, how are the inflation forecasts made? Um, and everybody uh, has been involved in the forecasting business knows, of course, this is also kind has also some kind of, of uh, there's a lot of judgment in these in these forecasts. Also, all the forecasters have their models. In the end, uh, there's a lot of, of judgment which which is used, and, and so these forecasts have uh, not something if you can just take out of the computer and say, yeah. Get the results. These these forecasters uh, they, they adjust the data they get from their models with a lot of, of judgment, and so one has to be aware of this. Uh, but as I said, if you can compare the forecasts of many institutions with the central bank's forecast, then you get get a relatively good feeling whether uh, the central bank forecast is biased or not. And um, uh, of course, the risk is. If you just if you just uh, focus on uh, inflation as a target of central bank policy, there's always a risk that um, that it's too one-dimensional. That you can get uh, you do not it can be a situation where you do not pay enough uh, attention to uh, financial sector stability. But I think after the financial crisis, I think all central banks are now fully aware that kind of one-dimensional policy focusing single-minded on price stability is not, not enough. So, as I said, the ECB is, is not, um, not um, explicitly uh, an, EC, an, 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 an IT adopter. Uh, the arguments of, uh, of the ECB which are from 2011, are in my view, not really convincing. So the ECB says the inflation figure does not provide a comprehensive and reliable framework for identifying the nature of threats to price stability. I don't know. So, but it's, it's the inflation figure is, of course, uh, the most uh, effective way uh, to to specify the threats to price stability, so I don't know what, these, what other threats to price stability has to be in mind. If, if they are not if threats, if threats to price stability do not show up in the inflation rate, what threats are they? Um, and then the ECB says yes, it's very arbitrary. Uh, the, the time horizon, that fixed time horizon of two years, is arbitrary. Well, you can see from the ECB that it is using different time horizons, one year, two year, five years, so it can do this in a very pragmatic way. Um, and um, it says, yes, uh, it's difficult to integrate the information contained in monetary aggregates in inflation forecasts. Yeah, but <laughs> if, if either monetary aggregates have an effect on Inflation, then you have to <laughs> they have to be in the inflation forecast, and if they have no effect, they're outside the inflation forecast. Uh, and then the ECB said it takes the view that relying on a single forecast would not be appropriate. Well, I don't know. So I think these arguments are not very convincing, and but they're also from a relatively old uh, booklet with, uh, presented by the ECB in 2011. I don't know whether the ECB still would adhere to these arguments. Um, we have another question. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, price stability is the main objective of inflation targeting, but isn't it supposed to be also the main one of monetary targeting? Yes. Yes, monetary targeting, uh, as I said, is really based on this quantity theory in a very simple way. And the idea of, of the quantity theory is that they're very direct, very proportional 
relationship between priceability and, and the money stock. And that's if, if you take the quality equation, and if you assume that the velocity is constant, if you assume that real output is constant, then you see that uh, monetary growth and inflation uh, move have, have the same have the same uh, developments. Yeah. So, but this question is good because of course it has to make this explicit. Yeah. Okay. Good. So then we come to the final rule. I think maybe we make it today when we go through the strategic aspects. So then we have the Taylor rule. That's the third strategy that plays a role in monetary policy discussions. And as I said, um, monetary targeting comes from monetarism. Inflation targeting is relies very much on the Phillips curve and the Taylor rule is a kind of hybrid rule because it is, is, is one uh, one pillar, so to say, for for the Taylor rule is the classical theory with its with its uh, neutral uh, interest rate, and the other pillar is the idea that by changing short-term interest rates, uh, the central bank can of course have a strong impact on the real sector of the economy. So it combines the classical world uh, with the Keynesian world. But when the Taylor rule was developed, discovered, uh, this was not uh, a, a theoretical uh, undertaking. It was a very pragmatic approach. And uh, it was John Taylor, a very famous US economist, who tried in the early 1990s to find a kind of mechanical uh, relationship in the interest rate decisions of the Fed. So that is, this is a simple formula which allows us to, to explain uh, the, the, the interest rate decisions, which, which allows us to explain the path of the federal funds rate. And I said uh, last, last week that um, the federal funds rate is the policy rate of the uh, Federal Reserve. So the federal funds rate 100% reflects the intentions of uh, the Federal Reserve uh, on how to how to, to 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 target to control the economy, and so um, in 1993, um, John Taylor uh, wrote this, this wrote a paper where he um, where he showed this chart, and here you can see in the chart um, the uh, dotted line is the. the the, the black line is the federal funds rate. That's exactly what the Fed did. And the dotted line is now uh, uh, this, the, the development of uh, the, um, the short interest rate according to the formula that John Taylor has identified. This is a very impressive fit. I think that's John Taylor became very famous for this. Also, it's a very simple calculation that he made. So the, the, the formula, formula that he used to, to, uh, to, uh, to get this, uh, this data uh, is this equation, uh, which shows that the, uh, that the federal funds rate um, is determined by the inflation rate, by Two and two is we show uh, later. Two is kind of neutral real interest rate, and then by zero point five times the inflation gap plus zero point five zero point five times the output gap. So a very very simple very very simple formula um, to derive this chart on the right side. And um, yeah, so that's impressive. <laughs> it's such a simple formula you can describe uh, what the what the uh, Fed did, and I think that was quite impressive. And that this is why this this rule is so is so um, become so famous. And um, in a more general version, now so, so these are the concrete values for which. Uh, Taylor developed the rule, but it can now, of course, present in a more general version where you can say the nominal interest rate equals the inflation rate plus the neutral real interest rate plus the inflation gap plus the output gap. Yeah. 
and you can also present it in real terms. So then you can say the real interest rate equals the neutral real interest rate plus zero times five the inflation gap plus zero times five the output gap, which is a secret problem. So um, what is important here is that if we have here the real interest rate, this is the money interest rate deflated by the inflation rate. So that's just the federal funds rate minus the inflation rate. While this uh, uh, square is, so, so this is our, um, what's that? No, so that, sorry about that. So this, <laughs> this, uh, R with, uh, with, a line, with, a, with a line above uh, is now the real rate or the neutral rate. So it's, it's the idea is this is a real rate which is derived out of the classical model, which, which represents a kind of physical uh, relationship um, um, and which is neutral with respect to monetary, monetary developments. And so we have this kind of combination of a uh, the classical model with this neutral interest rate, with a rule which 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 uh, defines a central bank interest rate with which a central bank can target the real economy. That's something, of course, which is not compatible with the um, classical model. So, um, and the heuristic, heuristic is simple if. The economy is equilibrium. If there's neither an output gap nor inflation gap, the policy rate should be at the level of the real rate. Yeah? And so Laubach and Williams, uh, who have written a very important paper on this neutral rate, which is often also called R star, say the neutral rate of interest rate presents, represents a median, median run real anchor for monetary policy. And then of course, if you have a situation uh, where you do not have an equilibrium, where you have positive output gap, positive inflation gap, or negative output gap, negative inflation gap, then the central bank uh, should choose an interest rate that is above or below the real interest rate in order to stimulate the economy or to uh, dampen uh, the economy. And the logic of this approach, so that the central bank can, can exert a positive or negative impact on the economy by having its interest rate above or below the real rate. So that the deviation of the central bank interest rate from this neutral rate, that this is important uh, for, for the economy in a positive or negative way, this idea goes back to Knut Wicksell, the Swedish economist, who is very famous until today uh, because he tried the synthesis of the classical model with the uh, monetary model. And we'll have shortly a look at it because first it, it, it's the basis, so to say, for this Taylor rule, but it's also important to see how he tries to get the synthesis of classical and monetary, you might remember, that I said some weeks ago that it's not possible to get such a synthesis, but we still tried it and we will have shortly, let's have a short look uh, how he presents his theory. So in his, he wrote it in German, his book Geldsins and Güterpreise, but of course it's translated to English. And he says, there is a certain rate of interest on loans, which is neutral in respect to commodity prices intends neither to raise or to lower them. So the kind of neutral rate. And this is necessary, this rate is necessarily the same as the rate of interest, which would be determined by the supply and demand if no use were made of money and all lending were effected in the form of capital goods. Lending in the form of capital goods, this is our all-purpose uh, commodity, you still remember. And so Vixel says, this neutral rate is the rate that we had, that, that, that 
that is the result of the classical model. A world without money, that's what it says. The rate, if no use were made of money, yeah, it comes to much the same thing to describe it as the current value of the natural rate of interest on capital. So this is exactly our classical world. Yeah? They said this neutral, net, neutral rate, natural rate, is a rate in a world without money. The classical world, exactly what we described. And now uh, it doesn't stop here. He says, well, but and of course he has observed how the world is going on. Um, there's, of course, he says, a monetary rate of interest because there are banks who lend money, and and this is not a a a, a how does he call it? Yeah, not, not a natural rate of interest, but it's a money rate. And he speaks of a monetary rate of interest. And now he says, okay, if this money rate of interest uh, is identical with the natural rate, then we are in the world of the classical model. So he says, now if money is loaned at this same rate of interest, it serves as nothing more than a cloak to cover a procedure which from the purely formal point of view could have been carried on equally without it. The conditions of economic equilibrium are fulfilled in precisely the same manner. So if the interest rate for money is identical with this neutral rate, then we are de facto in the classical world where so money is there. Quite interesting. So we have mechanisms of the classical world. And now the interesting thing is, what happens if this monetary rate does not equal natural rate? And so this is something that Fixel also discusses. If the money rate deviates from the neutral rate, then we come into the world of the monetary paradigm. Quite interesting. <laughs> so if, if the two interest rates are the same, classical world, if the money rate goes up or goes down, uh, is lower than the natural rate, then suddenly we are in the world of the um, monetary model. Then he says, so for the situation uh, of, a mon of a money rate below the, um, uh, the natural rate, Bixell says the supply of money is thus furnished by the demand itself. That's exactly our uh, banking model where the banks uh, loan, uh, lend money uh, to, uh, to its customers, then money is supplied. So when people want money, ask for a loan, then the supply of money comes out of the loan. And, um, <clears throat> and he says, it follows that the banks, or rather the aggregate of banks taken as a whole, can within limits to be stipulated in a moment, lend any desired of amount, any desired amount of money for any desired period of time at any desired rate of interest, no matter how long, without affecting their solvency, even though their deposits may be falling due all the time. So that's exactly a very simple mechanism of our monetary model that banks, in principle, can lend uh, without, without limits. There are some limits, but in principle, there are no limits in terms of funding. They can generate. Uh, uh, as, as much money as they want, as long as they are able to lend to uh, their customers. And then for, for Wixell, it follows, it follows that if the rest of our theory is correct, the banks can raise the general level of prices to any desired height. So the idea is you have this natural rate as an anchor. If you have the monetary rate identical with the natural rate, then you are still in the world of the classical paradigm. If you reduce the monetary rate below the natural rate, then all the mechanisms of the monetary model start to operate. So banks lend and lend, and this bank lending, of course, increases economic activity, and the higher economic activity leads to higher prices and the other way around. And well, that's, that's this uh, principle of this is the theory of Excel. And of course, it sounds quite convincing, but um, if you think a little bit of it, it's 
a little bit strange. So, so you are in equilibrium, money rate equals natural rate. Then you have all the mechanisms of the classical model operating, saving gener generates investment and banks need uh, the uh, low the deposits before, before they can lend. Then if the money rate goes a little bit below this, then the system operates exactly in the opposite way. A little bit strange. But anyhow, um, Nick Sell became very famous for this. And this logic that the monetary rate below or above the real rate has a stimulating or dampening effect on the economy. This is exactly the logic which underlies the Taylor rule. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, if, if you have a positive uh, inflation gap, so let's say this is positive, and a positive output gap, then the central bank has to increase the real interest rate above this neutral rate and vice versa. So, um, and um, yeah, how was the performance with the Taylor rule? Um, in the 2000s, uh, the Taylor rule worked quite well. I must say I was also convinced that the Taylor rule is a good navigation system for monetary policy because here in the years when we had uh, uh, processes leading to the financial crisis in the euro area, you could see that the Taylor interest, that the Taylor, uh, that the actual interest rate, the gray line was way below uh, the Taylor uh, rule interest rate. So the, the orange and black line uh, are the Taylor rule interest rates for the euro area. And so one could say, yes, had the ECB paid sufficient attention to the Taylor rule, they would have realized very early that something is going wrong. So then I, so, so I must say, I was quite convinced that this, this, this is a very, very good rule um, showing uh, relatively early that there are risks for the whole system, probably not for price stability, but for financial stability. So with this experience came the years after the financial crisis. And here we then we again had enormous difference uh, between Taylor rural interest rates and the ECB's policy rate. And so this, with a strong belief in the Taylor rule, this, this of course uh, would have then given, led, led to, the, to the assessment, there are strong inflationary risks. And in fact, um, this uh, assessment uh, was made by many economists, especially by my colleagues, the German, uh, the German Council of Economic Experts. Um, and uh, yeah, if, you, if you looked at, at the Taylor Rule in 2014, 15, 16, 17, you saw a continuing uh, deviation of the Taylor Rule interest rates from the ECB interest rate. And of course, believing in the Taylor Rule, um, you must come to the assessment. There are a lot, uh, there are serious inflation risks for the, for the Euro area. Um, but, but the main problem of the, of the Taylor rule is that this real interest rate, which is the anchor, which is the attractive thing, because compared to inflation targeting and monetary targeting, only the Taylor rule gives you a concrete value for the interest rate. Inflation targeting can only show you with the prevailing interest rates and the prevailing expectations of interest rates, we will reach the inflation target or not. But it does not tell you what is the adequate interest rate. And the same thing with monetary targeting. So if you have, if you have monetary growth, which is too, too strong, it only indicates you there are risks to inflation, but it does not tell you how much you have to raise your interest rate. And so the fancy thing with the Taylor rule is that it gives you a concrete value for the interest rate. 
And the concrete value depends on the anchor of these real interest rates. The real anchor in, in, this, in this formula, um, which gives you the level uh, of, of, the, of, your, of your policy rate. But the problem, of course, comes from the fact that this neutral real rate from the classical model is something which does not really does not exist in reality. As, as we have shown, saving an investment, which are the key determinants of the real rate in the classical model, in the monetary model, and also in reality, do not determine any kind of real interest rate. So it's it's this real neutral rate of the classical model is a phantom. It exists only in this theory, in this theoretical world of this theory, that there's no correlate for uh, this uh, rate in reality. And so there's a problem if you base a, a rule, a navigation system on something which does not exist and which can also not measure if you really uh, take the if you really follow consequently the classical model, there's a problem, and, and you can see it see it uh, in calculations in, that that were made uh, for the United States and for the Euro area uh, by uh, my colleagues in the German Council of Economic Experts, and you can see the huge confidence intervals for uh, the uh, equilibrium interest rate in the United States and uh, in uh, and for and, and for for the uh, Germany and and the Euro area. So here for the United States, for instance, you can see that uh, there is a divergence of it's amazing five plus five to minus I don't know minus five or something like this. So the confidence stands are huge, which means more or less it's almost impossible to get a get a kind of sufficient uh, sufficiently stable anchor. Uh, for for the for this real interest rate, you can also here see these are these are estimates by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which show and this can explain why it, the problems in the euro area, how much the real interest rate has declined, equilibrium interest rate has declined since the financial crisis um, by more or less than yeah I think if you, if you go back to to Taylor's uh, to the time when Taylor made its, its um, uh, analysis of the Fed in the, in the late 1980s or early 1990s. So at that time, our star, so this equilibrium rate was about 3%, and then the Fed estimates it only at 1%. And the similar, similar deviations are also there for, uh, for the advanced economies. And so if this anchor that you use in the Taylor rule is not a stable anger, and also a very uncertain anger. There's a risk that you make uh, strong misjudgments when you when you um, when you rely on the Taylor rule as your navigation system for for monetary policy. And, and um, so, my my colleagues in the Council of Economic Experts warned for years. Uh, that the ECB is confronted with increasing inflationary risks. And this assessment was only based on the Taylor rule. And in retrospect, one can say they were wrong. And I, I'm happy enough that I've always, when we wrote these reports, have written a minority report based on inflation forecasts. And I said, look at the inflation forecasts for the euro area for the medium term. There are absolutely no signs that will have inflation. Uh, and and uh, so forget about the Taylor rule, look at inflation forecast and with this very simple uh, navigation system of inflation forecast, I must say it was much better uh, than my colleagues who believed uh, in, this, um, in, this, in this Taylor rule and, and who com got it completely wrong, warned of inflationary risk, financial stability risk for years and they never materialized. So, one can say the Taylor rule looks nice um, and, and it, it looks attractive because it really comes close to a heuristic. 
it, it, it helps you to reduce the very complex process of determining central bank interest rates with this very simple formula, which looks so nice. You just fill in the output gap, the inflation rate, and, and, and then you have it. And then you can say, okay, with a simple formula, I can, I can determine adequate monetary policy rate. So that's extremely attractive, and that's why I was also uh, for many years uh, very very happy with this with this Taylor rule and used it for all kinds of analysis. But um, yeah, the problem is the anchor is not really an anchor. The anchor is 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 volatile, and the anchor is also uh, allows a lot of variation. Um, how to how to how to define its its concrete value, and and yeah, the the main problem is, as I said, that there is no such thing of the neutral real rate in reality. It's, it's really a phantom of the classical theory. Of course, you can try to to, to calculate all kind of neutral rates, and uh, and the rates that I've shown you um, by by the by the Fed are mainly rates equilibrium rates that are calculated using the AS curve. Now, of course, you can, can try to estimate my S curve and can then ask, which is the interest rate given the S curve that leads to full employment. So I think in the Keynesian model, you can derive some kind of optimum interest rate and say, which interest rate is required given the S curve that they get full employment. And so that kind of optimum interest rate, which, which is something which you can do in the in the uh, in the Keynesian model, but this real interest rate in the classical model is something which simply doesn't exist. And if you try to calculate, estimate something which doesn't exist, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> and another another problem uh, of the of the Taylor rule is the output gap. You can just write it down in the formula. You can say, okay, this is uh, why the output gap. But uh, if you look at the data for the output gap. Um, it's very difficult uh, to estimate output gaps in real time. And it's one of the variables that is really uh, readjusted many years later. And you can see five years, three years later that an output gap that was maybe positive is become, turns out negative or the other way around. So the output gap is also a very unreliable uh, uh, concept. And, and this also is an additional additional problem uh, in the Taylor rule, which looks so simple, but to get the real right output gap is also difficult. And as I said, uh, in the 2010s, 2010s, the Taylor rule, rule has led to serious misjudgments, uh, misjudgments of the ECB's monetary policy stance. And I mentioned my colleagues in the Council of Economic Experts, uh, had a chapter which is the heading low interest rates not appropriate for either the euro area or Germany 2016. And then one can say this is low interest rates which uh, were maintained until the pandemic. I think the euro area did very well. Here you see the then German of our council, Christoph Schmidt, handing over the report to the Chancellor uh, Angelika Merkel. Okay, so what are the implications? For the ECB's strategic review, it's obvious the 1998 strategy was flawed. The reference value for money was bound to fail, and the real, uh, real analysis was too vague for a heuristic. Monetary targeting is today definitely not an option. The Taylor rule worked well, but it failed uh, in the last 10 years. And as I said, there is no such thing as a neutral interest rate outside the classical model. And it's quite nice that Keynes made this statement uh, very explicit. And in his general theory, he said, I'm no longer of the opinion that the concept of a natural rate of interest has anything useful to contribute to our analysis. Very clear statement. It's general theory, you <laughs> also find many statements which are not so clear. And then he says, if there's any such rate of interest, which is unique, it must be the rate which is consistent with full employment, given the other parameters of the system. So this rate might be better described perhaps as the optimum rate. And if you 
uh, having in mind the uh, IS curve uh, of the Keynesian model, you can see, okay, we have our full employment uh, output level, and then the rate that should be targeted by the central bank is a rate which, which leads to full employment giving uh, the IS curve. And as Keynes rightly says, I would not call this a neutral rate, but not too rate. And so overall, I think inflation targeting is in my view the best solution. And I think many, many central banks practice it. So there must be a reason for this. And so the best thing the ECB could do now is to shift from this implicit inflation targeting to explicit inflation targeting and give up uh, this, this two pillar strategy, which in my view was, was from the very beginning, not very convincing. And I think here we are. I stop here. Um, we can also do uh, a discussion of the Taylor rule within our IS uh, PC and P model in a formal way. I think uh, we've, you've done that already, the tutorials. Uh, I think that's quite interesting way to see the mechanics of the Taylor rule to compare it to optimum uh, monetary policy. You can see that optimum policy is always better than the Taylor rule because optimum policy reacts directly to the shocks, while the Taylor rule uh, reacts to the money, to the um, to the actual uh, inflation rate and to the actual output rate. But I think you did that in the tutorials, and so I will stop here. Thank you very much. It was a little bit, a uh, lot of, <laughs> lot of stuff for today, but um, I hope I've given you some idea on these monetary policy strategies. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please ask. Maybe you're all a little bit exhausted, like me, because it's now become really relatively <laughs> hot here. Um, okay, if not, then thank you very much for listening, for attending. And as I said, we try every, anything we can do to at least to make it possible that those who are uh, close to Wolfsburg that we can meet firstly. I would really love to see you all in person and to say hello to you and so. Let's keep fingers crossed that maybe in two or three weeks at least we can meet in person. Thank you, bye-bye.